Okay, let's have the next speaker, uh, which is Paolo Navalesi, and he will be going. He will be talking about partial ventilatory support, pressure support, or proportional assisted ventilation. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, well, every time I read uh, versus something, I think at uh, black and white presentation. So something has to be better than something else. This won't be the case. I'm going to stay in the shades of gray, which, uh, which is often the case in life, actually. So let me start uh, with uh, a sentence I agree upon that uh, uh, a major if not the primary goal of mechanical ventilation is to decrease a patient's work of breathing. So first question is, do these two modes equally or one better or the other decrease the work of breathing? This is the work recently published in Critical Care by Mark Vizocchi and co-worker comparing non-invasive PAV with non-invasive pressure support in COPD patient with an exacerbation and hypercapnic respiratory failure. And as you can see from the P-ESO tracing, the esophageal pressure tracing, both pressure support and PAV were able to decrease the effort performed by the inspiratory muscle to a similar extent. So both can decrease the work of breathing. Let's move back to the previous sentence and let's try to complete it. Achievement of this goal is dependent on satisfactory patient ventilator interaction. That is, the machine needs to cycle in unison with the rhythmic contraction of a patient respiratory muscle. Actually, I like very much the, the unison width which I will try to pass through in the next slides. This is pressure support, flow, airway, and transdiaphragmatic pressure in a post-operative subject with fairly normal respiratory muscle function. Between the two green dotted line, you have the time during which the machine is delivering air to the patient, while during the two yellow solid lines, you have the time when the muscle is contracting. So between the two yellow line, you have the neural, so to speak, inspiratory time, while between the two green lines, you have the machine inspiratory time. And as you can see, beside a little delay at the beginning, right at the end, the unison is pretty good. The interaction is pretty good. This is a COPD patient, same ventilator, nothing is changing. And this is the same kind of tracing. And here you see that there is a considerable lag between the neural inspiratory time and the machine inspiratory time. And actually, the unison time is pretty small. Now, you can use whatever mode of ventilation you want, but you are not going to change this delay at the onset of inspiration. You have to use CPAP, you have to use a different type of triggering. This is not influenced by the type of mode you use. Something can be done to improve synchrony at the end of inspiration. And let's move to something has been shown by the previous uh, uh, speaker. Uh, the way pressure support cycle is more or less this. You achieve a peak inspiratory flow, and then you have a decay of the inspiratory flow. Normally, ventilators are set in a way that the ventilators cycle off into expiration when 25% of this peak value is achieved. But in many machines, you may be able to change this threshold in this case, I made a simulation changing at 75% of the peak value. And as you can see, these produce a reduction in the inspiratory time. So coming back to the previous slide, changing the threshold of the expiratory uh, trigger, we might have been able to improve synchronicity. Well, when we use PAV, we don't have to think about this threshold because the ventilator is um, receive a message from the patient that tells stop breathing. And when? 
you have to think that the airway pressure during PAV is at any point in time proportional to the flow and the volume generated by patient effort, which means, in principle, that when the muscles stop sucking air, well, stop, sorry, uh, contracting, then flow and volume are stopped and the machine stop pushing air to the patient, which is true and not true. There are a few problems. This is the very complex interaction between the patient and the ventilator during PAV. I don't want to pass through all this. Just let me show you that this is inspiratory muscle contraction that generates volume and flow. Then, depending on the PAV setting, you receive some degree of mechanical support. And the mechanical support is going to influence the flow and the volume, which constitute a loop. And in some point at this loop, in this loop, you might have troubles. And the fact that troubles may interfere with the proper functioning of PFB, as be shown by this uh, uh, paper by Du and co-worker, what they did in a computer simulation first and in a mechanical lung simulation later on, they tested the delay at the end of inspiration with PAV. And they found that it was proportional to the gain. So the highest the support, the highest the delay at end inspiration. And it was proportional to the time constant. So the longest the time constant, the most the delay. Which means that, for instance, if I have a patient with high expiratory resistance and, high, and uh, pretty normal compliance, which is more or less a COPD, which are the patients where we have more trouble to get a good patient-ventilator interaction, the delay becomes really important. And this is a tracing from a patient showing that, you see, the, the dotted line indicate the point at which transdiaphragmatic pressure peak. This is pressure support. And this is the same tracing during PAV. And as you can see, there is a clear lag between the peak of transdiaphragmatic pressure, which is muscle, and the peak of support, indicating that some kind of lag actually occurs. It, this slide has been shown by Christer before. This is a work by Jennifer work, Beck and co-worker, showing that with two different levels of pressure support, Actually, high pressure support level indicated by the thicker line and low pressure support level by the thinnest line, regardless of the fact that the highest support corresponded to lower effort, the inspiratory tidal volume at the point at which the electrical activity of the dry diaphragm peaked was actually the same. And this was confirmed regardless of the level of support across a large number, I guess 10, 12 patients. So let's see what is the behavior with PEV. This is another patient. And uh, again, we confirm the data by Beck and co-worker. At peak PDI, only a small part of the volume was generated. And the rest of the volume was generated while the, pa while the patient was insufflated almost passively. And this is PAV. And you see that at the peak activity of the diaphragm, not all of the volume was generated. And actually, most of the volume was generated in a passive condition. And these are group mean data from the same study showing that the tidal volume generated at peak diaphragm activity was not different during spontaneous breathing, during PAV, and during pressure support. And that the significant increase in tidal volume was actually due to machine insufflation. What is the behavior of gas exchange? Again, Mark Vizocchi and co-worker, both PAV and pressure support were equally good. However, in this comparison, PAV resulted more comfortable than pressure support during non-invasive ventilatory support. Now, we know that leaks are probably the major determinant of comfort during non-invasive ventilation. 
I don't think that PAV could do any better in terms of leaks than pressure support as indicated by this tracing. This is a leak and as you can see the patient receive a continuous inflation because the volume is recognized as a signal. So the machine keeps delivering pressure in relationship to the, de to the leaked volume. So pressure support and PAV both have problems with leaks, which might be then the principle by which and, uh, the comfort is improved by PAV. Let me show these final slides. Uh, PSV and PAV, flow, volume, transdiaphragmatic pressure and airway pressure. You see in the upper panel we have different effort, low effort, high effort. The level of assistance is not changed at all and as a consequence the tidal volume is pretty stable. Now let's move to PAV. Again, we have a decreasing effort and at the same time we have a decreasing support and we see that the tidal volume changes accordingly. So it is pretty well recognized that when you go to analyze the spirogram during pressure support and during PAV, you can find something like this, a very stable breathing pattern during pressure support and a lot of variability during PAV, which might explain why the patient is more comfortable during PAV. So let me conclude that both pressure support and PAV improve gas exchange and reduce inspiratory effort. Compared to PSV, PAV improves patient comfort. PSV works well in, in many cases, however, it does not always guarantee a good patient ventilator interaction. Due to its specific feature, PAV may help to achieve a better patient ventilator interaction. However, it is not the ultimate solution for this problem. I thank you for your attention. Some question? Some question? Just one there. Yes. Thank you for this excellent presentation. I would like to ask if the proportion assessed ventilation is the primary mode for ventilation or can be used for weaning. The second, would you kindly uh, tell us the, innovated, or the innovator of the proportion assessed ventilation? Who discovered it? Thank you. Excuse me, I, I missed the last question, the last part. Of the the one who discovered it or the one who designed it. The, the you mean Meg Dunes? Yes. Oh, okay. So. So Meg Dunes is the person who, who developed the algorithm of PAV. Uh, sorry, I, I apologize, I forgot to mention. And uh, whether or not uh, PAV can be a winning tool, well, I would say yes, of course, as any form of partial ventilatory support, it might be uh, a, a mode to win the patient. Uh, the question I tried to add something is that uh, uh, so far, most of the study have been concentrated in COPD and they show pretty reasonable results. Unfortunately, my experience is that COPD are those where PAV works worst. And I found PAV more useful in other patient populations. So probably when we discuss about which is best between two modes of ventilation, we should also think in which type of underlying pathology. So, uh, one question is, do you recommend it to, for COPD exacerbated or for everybody or what? Or well, any well, special situation? Uh, well, because you say that the, the virus increase the comfort of the patient. No, uh, the problem is how to measure it you know, or sure, how to decide. Sure. Uh, there are, with PAV, there are two problems. So the first is that setting the ventilator is not such an easy task because, uh, in principle, you should know respiratory mechanics. Well, I'm using, I have PAV in a couple of ventilators in my unit and uh, I do use it. If I have to be honest, it's more or less 10% of the whole patient, so not so much. And uh, uh, unfortunately, as I said, COPD are those where I, I, I'm probably not very good. I mean, I can get very good results. 
and uh, probably um, acute restriction of lung injuries are the patient able to maintain spontaneous breathing, not very sick RDS, are those where I saw best results. But uh, don't ask me why. I have an idea, but it's not. Uh... Okay. 